How are we doing, Carlos? Good. <clears throat> well, good morning. Um, my name is Tim Amit. For those of you who don't know me, I've been here, a member here uh, for many years. I'm, I'm now also an elder, and I'm really honored to, to speak with you this morning. Let me start with a little apology. The outline that you have in your bulletin is not what I'm going to go by. Um, sorry. The texts, all I think all three of them are in here, are in the message, but it's different. <laughs> um, but that's okay. So um, this has been a really crazy year for me, especially for my brain. Um, I've learned some things this year that I can hardly believe that I didn't know before. And here's a, an example. Um, I learned that when you drink water, it's really important that you also have sodium in your body. Otherwise, the water will just pass through and you get practically no benefit. I did not know that. And I just learned that, and I was talking about it with my kids at home, and my nephew, Colin Asplin, was there, and he said, oh, yeah. At, at Bethel, when we have football practice, we put salt tablets in our water so we don't get dehydrated. I didn't know that. I did not know that. If I were to use a Dale scale, say from one to I'm an idiot, I'm the winner. How's that? Is that a good Dale scale? And here's another one. And this one for me is literally life-changing. <clears throat> I le learned that the earth is basically a ginormous battery. And that God designed us, human beings, as electrical creatures. And if we come in contact with the battery, the earth, we receive tremendous health benefits. I had never heard this before. I shocked me. And frankly, when I first heard that, I thought it was really weird and crazy. But this past summer, I was, now many of you, no, many of you maybe do know, but some don't. Um, about 10 years ago, I had open heart surgery, like the full Monty. Cut me open, split me open. I had a mitral valve repaired. And um, in the process, the doctors think that they accidentally cut some of the electrical wiring, and, which is understandable, right? They did cut me open, and my heart was basically spliced in half. It's crazy to think about. And because of that, um, I frequently go into atrial fibrillation, where my heart will race um, about sometimes 180, 200 beats a minute while I'm sitting down. And it's very irregular, and it's really bad, and high risk of stroke, and not a good thing. Well, if I go into atrial fibrillation um, and I don't come out of it quickly, I have to go to the hospital and get zapped. Like they knock me out with meds, put me on a, you know, I'm on a bed when they do that. And then they pat on the front, pat on the back, zap, reset my heart. Now I'm back in the normal rhythm. I've had that done maybe at least a half a dozen times probably. My wife probably knows, but it's, it's maybe even closer to 10 times since my surgery. So this past summer, I was uh, at home, and I went into atrial fibrillation in the morning, and I had a really busy day of work. I had a lot of roofs I had to go look at, a lot of projects in the cities, and I'm like, I can't take the day off. I'm going. Not a good idea. I got to Waverly, and you know, the roads in Waverly are really bouncy, and you got potholes you got to avoid, and it just seems to exasperate everything. So I'm driving through Waverly, and... I literally thought I was going to pass out, and I decided to pull over, and I pulled over to a little park just north of Highway 12 there, kind of by the Domino's Pizza, and, um, and the thought occurred to me, hey, touch the ground, and, and really, I, it, was, it was a little bit shocking, so I, I said, okay, so I got out of the truck, I sat down on the ground, and I put my hand on the grass, and I immediately came out of AFib, immediately. And I know when I'm in AFib, it's not a fun feeling. Like I said, my heart is racing. My chest up here feels full. can barely talk because I get winded. 
not a good thing. And I immediately came out of it. And that shocked me. Amazing. Thank you, God. I, when I go into AFib, I, afterwards I get really tired because your heart is racing 180 beats a minute for a long time. I took a nap, went to the cities, did my thing. The next day, the same thing happened. I was at home, went into AFib, like, oh, no. What am I going to do? I said, okay, I'm going to go outside. I sat on the grass, I put my hand in the grass, and I came out of it immediately. I was a believer. Wow, that's amazing. I can't believe I didn't know this before. So ever since then, I've been grounding every day. Most days, when it's warm, I step outside in the early morning, when the, especially when the water is wet. It's beautiful. Walk on bare feet, 10, 15 minutes, and I have never felt better. And I haven't gone into AFib for months now. I'm off my medication. It's a great, great benefit. Right? Yeah, thanks. Yep. Now, why do I tell you those stories? I thought this was a sermon. What's he talking about? What, the same thing that happened to me with the sodium and with the, the touching the earth like a, a battery also happened to me this year, theologically. Now, my theological understanding really has taken a pretty dramatic turn, but it's not a U-turn, okay? It's rather a turn down a road that I did not even know existed. What we're going to talk about today, something that I did not even know that it was a thing to explore, and it was really a game changer for me. Now, please don't be afraid. While the passage of scripture we're going to examine is controversial, it's not that controversial. We're not talking about heretical issues. And I'm not saying that I used to believe one thing and now I believe another. I never really thought about it. But now thinking about it and studying it, and it has literally changed the framework by which I look at the Bible as a whole. The scripture we're going to talk about is found in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. If you have your Bible, please open it and read along with me. So here we go. Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 5, it says this. When men began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive and they took as their wives any that they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim, or the giants, were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's the end of the passage that we read. So if I were to summarize this passage, here's how I would say it. Sometime before Noah's flood, fallen angels had relations with human women and they had babies. Their offspring were extraordinary in strength and evil, resulting in the worldwide flood. Now, those who would disagree with me would have some objections, or at the very least some questions, and I'm guessing that you do too. First off, angels with women. Really. Can angels be with women? Thankfully... This is not the only text that talks about angels. There's many biblical texts that talks about angels. If I were to mention some of these, which I'm going to, you'll probably say the same thing that I did. Oh, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Now listen to this one. Think of this one. Think of Abraham and Sarah. You know the story where Sarah laughed when she was told, you're going to have children? It says that three angels met with them. And what did the angels do? The text specifically says they ate a meal. They have physical characteristics. They could eat food. How about this one? 
Think of the story of Jacob when he gets his name changed to Israel. How did he get his name changed? Why did he get his name changed? You probably know the answer. He wrestled with an angel. It wasn't a ghost. He had a physical body. The angel wrestled with Jacob, even touched Jacob, and dislocated his hip. Or how about the story of Lot in Sodom? It says he was visited by angels. Lot brought him to his home. And the people tried to break in the door so that they could be with the angels. Now, as Tim Hawkins would probably say, this is not one of those stories that you would find in your Precious Moments Bible. <laughs> you can see... In scripture, that angels have bodies, at the very least, when they appear to us, they have bodies just like us. Another objection, for those who do not see an element of fallen angel involvement in Genesis 6, is in the phrase, sons of God. There's an argument that the phrase refers just to men. For time, I'm not going to explain their position, but rather I will explain why it seems clear to me that the phrase sons of God is referring to fallen angels. The strongest argument I feel to make the case is that the sons of God were actually fallen angels is in the text itself, meaning right from the passages in the Bible. As a, as a side note, I want to just say one of the, the, the source material that I've read a lot of come from a guy, an author named Ryan Peterson. He's got two books, The um, Fall of the Nephilim, and the second one is The, is the uh, Return of the Nephilim. And then another one, Dr. Michael Heiser, who, his book, uh, Unseen Realm. Very well respected. Uh, they've been so helpful to me, so helpful. One of them, the, one, the ones, I mean, both Michael Heiser and Peterson, they're, they're great at like, just using the Bible, Using the Bible, that's not the right phrase. Referring to the Bible, referencing the Bible as our source. The phrase sons of God in Hebrew is Banai Ha Elohim. It is used in the Old Testament a number of times, always referring to angelic beings. We see it used in Job, chapters 1 and 2. You guys are probably familiar with the story of Job. Two times there is a reference to when the adversary, Satan, meets with Job. Both times the, refers to the sons of God. It says the sons of God came to serve God and among them came the adversary in both Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. And it's the same phrase, Benai Ha Elohim, sons of God. In Job chapter 38, this is one of my favorite passages, my daughter, this is a my daughter Rachel and I, since she's been seven years old, we, to this day, if I say to her, Rachel, are you ready? Or she'll say to me, Dad, are you ready? And then we go into this. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. And he says, do you know on what the earth's base was placed? He said to Job. Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The answer to God's rhetorical question to Job was, I don't know. I wasn't there. The only beings present when God created the earth were the Benai Ha Elohim, the sons of God. There also are three New Testament references to the Genesis 6 event. Peter mentions it in both of his letters, and Jude mentions it. 1 Peter 3, this is one of the verses that I was going to focus on today in my original outline, it says, He was put to death in the flesh but brought to life by the Spirit. And in this form, obviously speaking of Jesus, okay, 
In this form, he went, Jesus went. This is amazing to me. He went and he made a proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago in the days of Noah, when God waited patiently during the building of the ark. Isn't that amazing? Jesus died. His body was in the tomb. His spirit, where did he go? He went down and he showed the angels, look what I have done. You tried to stop me, but you didn't. I love that passage. Love it. Peter was writing to the church to encourage them, trying to spur them on to be faithful, even maybe to the point of physical persecution, if need be. And he mentioned Jesus as an example. Jesus, after all, suffered physically even to death, and then in the spirit went to proclaim to the fallen angels what he had done. And then again in Jude, verse 6, it says, and this is, this, this is Jude trying to encourage the believers, but more of a warning to the church to not be like the fallen angels who, quote, did not keep within their original authority, but abandoned their proper sphere. He has kept them in darkness, bound with everlasting change for the judgment of the great day. A plain reading of the text to me, seems super obvious who he was referring to. The fallen angels that came down and had babies with beautiful women. That's what the text says. Now listen to what R.A. Torrey, past president of my alma mater, Moody Bible Institute, said in his book, Difficulties in the Bible, Alleged Errors and Contradictions. This was written in 1907 says this, and he covers a lot. This is a long quote. It says, If we so interpreted here, the preaching was not all to men who had been w- wicked in the days of Noah, but to supernatural beings who had been disobedient in the days of Noah and who were now in prison in consequence of the disobedience. Are there any scripture passages that hint that there was supernatural beings who were disobedient in the days of Noah and who were consequently in prison? Are there? There are. In Genesis 6, chapter 1, we are told that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Our oratory continues. He said, Many commentators understood the descendants of Seth, a godly man, to be, quote, the sons of God in this passage. But if we are to interpret scripture by scripture, they seem to rather have been angelic beings. There seems to be a clear reference to this passage in Jude, chapter, Jude verse 6, excuse me, where we are told of angels which kept not their own principality but left their proper habitation and in consequence were kept in everlasting chains in darkness while the judgment, until the judgment of the great day. End of quote. I hope you're tracking with me. About a year ago, My wife was listening to a podcast where this Ryan Peterson, author of those books that I had mentioned, was a guest. What caught my attention mostly was that he was saying things that were completely off my radar. I was so intrigued that I spent the day listening to a lecture of his on YouTube. I then bought his first book and I studied it. I fell, honestly, I fell in love again with God's word and with God. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. To wrap things up, I have three points of application that I I hope to encourage you with. The first one is just is a personal. The last two are from the actual text. I hope they all can be encouraging to you. My my awakening, I would say, to the understanding of Genesis chapter 6 has created a fascination with the pre-flood world. I just can't get enough of learning about the ruins being discovered that are super old, existing before the flood. In a world that wants desperately to say that there is no God, more and more discoveries are proving the biblical record to be true. 
Do you know that around the world, ancient civilizations are being covered that talk about demigods, people who are offspring of gods and humans? Many of you probably are familiar with the Greek gods or Maui of the islands. But how about the Mesopotamian Apkalus or the Irish Ku Chulain? Or how about the African Tia Rock? Demigods in all of these cultures. They didn't have internet. They weren't talking to each other. Independently, there's carvings, there's writings, there's statues of demigods all over the world. And you know what else is extremely fascinating? In all of these cultures, they talk about a flood. A flood that destroyed the world because God was unhappy. And who died with it? These demigods. Is that a coincidence? They all kind of appeared at the same time. It's amazing to me. God, and God destroyed... I'm sorry, that was... That's the first part. That's the first part. That's the personal part. I, I just can't get enough. I, I, I have never, never wanted to travel. You can ask my wife. I don't want to leave the country. I have no interest to go to Mexico. None. Until now. I would love to go see these ruins. Stonehenge, all I knew, it was some rocks that were standing up somewhere. I don't even know where they are. I didn't even know where they are. I still don't know exactly where they are. <laughs> so fascinating. We have, we, have, we have megaliths here in the United States. There's one giant big one in, in, in Iowa, the Serpent Mound. They don't know how old that thing is. It's probably before the flood, they think. Thousands of years ago. Here's a couple of things from the text that, as I prayed about this, this is what I felt the Lord wanted to, to, to end us with. God destroyed the entire earth, everybody in it, except for one man and his family. And he imprisoned the perpetrators, the fallen angels, and they are still there. In all of the context, when the story is mentioned in the New Testament, the nature of the transgression is inappropriate physical relations. I chose to use that phrase because this is somewhat, I want it to be PG, but you understand what I'm saying. Relations outside of the bounds of what God has determined is super important. They become so casual, so cheap. I think we all might need a reminder of how meaningful and important it is. Do you see the connection between Genesis chapter 6 and Genesis chapter 1? I know we haven't talked about Genesis chapter 1, but I bet you most of you know what it, what it, what's in Genesis chapter 1. It's the first chapter of the Bible. <laughs> God created Adam and Eve, and what was his first command to Adam and Eve? First command, first thing he said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth and take control over it. In Genesis chapter 6, first verse, what does it say? Men began to multiply on the earth. The enemy saw. He saw what was happening. He said, God told them, be fruitful, multiply. The enemy said, uh-oh, they're multiplying. I need to take action. My exhortation to you is this. Know the tactic of the enemy. Don't be ignorant. I'm fascinated in the study of the story of Cain and Abel. You know that God said to Cain, said, sin is crouching at your door, Cain, but you can rule over it, he said to Cain. Cain killed Abel anyway. But God, was God lying, do you think? Was he just having a word game with Cain? No. He saw it. The enemy had been told in Genesis 3.15, your descendants, the descendants of the woman are going to defeat you, Satan. And from that first time, Satan was like, okay, i got to kill the descendants of the woman. Cain and Abel brought offerings. 
Cain's was not accepted. Abel's was. The enemy saw, ooh, that was a righteous offering. I need to get rid of that guy. That, maybe that's the descendant that's going to defeat me. All throughout scriptures, all throughout the scriptures, we see these instances where the enemy is trying to thwart God's plan. He did it with Cain and Abel. He did it in Genesis chapter 6 with the fallen angels. He did it all over the place. And he even, this is amazing, and this is, this is my last point. He even did it to Jesus. Do you know? Do you know that Satan thought by killing Jesus would be his victory? He thought that. He did not know that Jesus' death would mean his defeat. That is amazing to me. Listen to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul's talking about God's plan. We are communicating a secret wisdom from God, which has been hidden until now, but which before history began, God had decreed would bring us glory. Not one of the world's leaders has understood it. Because if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord from whom this glory flows. The enemy didn't know. He's been trying, but he didn't know. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2. I'm going to say it. Probably my favorite verse in the Bible. It is the glory of God to what? Conceal a matter. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, the honor of kings to search it out. God is glorified. He conceals. He hid it from the enemy. He hid it from the enemy. Worship team, are you around? Can you guys come up? So I'm going to ask, I asked, I've asked the worship team to lead us in a song. It's, kind of, it's an old one. I, I love it. Um, it's called Lord Most High. It's, a, it's an echoing song, if, you, if you're familiar with it. Um, the emphasis of the song is simple. The Lord is the Most High. There are, there are many gods with the small g. And they want, your, they want your devotion. They want to distract. And the enemy hasn't given up, has he? But God, Jehovah, he is, he is the most wise. He's the most powerful. He's the most loving. He's the most creative. He's the most beautiful. And he's the most high. And he deserves our praise. He deserves everything that we are. So, thank you. Let's, let's worship the Lord together, huh? Well, as we sing this song, if you feel led, because we're actually going to be doing communion after this as well. So if you need to take a few moments, however you need to use these next few moments as we sing this song, if you need to sit, if you need to stand, if you need to pray, whatever you need to do in these next few moments, would you please take this time to do that? Because we don't want to enter into communion in an unworthy manner. And if you didn't get a chance to grab elements on your way in, you can go to the worship center entrances. We have them right there. And then we will enter and we will partake of the Lord's Supper shortly in just a few.
hearts of the weak. From the hearts of the weak. From the shouts of the strong. From the shouts of the strong. From the lips of all people. From the lips of all people. This song we raise, Lord, throughout the endless ages. You will be crowned. thing that the Lord did by making a way for us to be redeemed and saved right away from the beginning, right after the fall in Genesis 3, all throughout the Old Testament, and finally revealed in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And it is that that we celebrate this morning by partaking of the Lord's Supper together. And on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. If you're able, would you please stand as we close with response and worship the God who made a way for us to be redeemed through Jesus. Bringing many souls 
sons to glory, grace on measure, love on Church, as you go from this place today, remember and trust in the name of Jesus. Whatever your circumstance, whatever you may face. Now to close with a benediction from the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now, and forever. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for worshiping with us here at Highland. You are loved. And here's another one I learned this year. And this one, for me, is, was drastically life-changing. I learned that the earth is basically a ginormous battery. And that God designed us, human beings, as electrical creatures. And if we come in contact with the earth, our bodies get tremendous health benefits. Now, this really came home to me. This past summer, now, probably some of you don't know, so I'll tell you, I had open heart surgery about 10 years ago. They needed to, I had a mitral valve prolapse and they needed to repair my mitral valve. In the process, the doctors think that they accidentally severed some of the electrical cords in my heart. And therefore, frequently I go into atrial fibrillation. My heart basically quivers beats about 180 to 200 beats a minute. And um, if I don't come out of atrial fibrillation, I have to go to the hospital and get zapped. Like they, you know, they knock me out with medication, and then they put a pad on the front, pad on the back, snap, and they reset my heart back to normal rhythm. I've had to have this done 
at least a half dozen times, probably closer to a dozen times in the past 10 years. So atrial fibrillation is a big deal for me. I went into AFib early summer. I was at home, and I had a lot of roofs to go walk on and projects to go look at to manage, and I couldn't take the day off. At least that's what I was thinking. So I drove into the cities, and by the time I got to Waverly, you know how bumpy the road is in Waverly? And it just exasperated everything. I literally thought I was going to pass out. I, was, I, I think I started to black out. I'm like, okay, i gotta, I got to pull over. I pulled over, and I had just learned about this. They call it grounding or earthing, where you touch the earth. Pulled over and I, and I stopped and I just was going to stay there for a little bit. And the thought came to my head, get out and touch the ground. So I got out of the truck, sat down on the ground, I put my hand on the grass and I immediately came out of AFib. Immediately. And when I'm in AFib, like I said, my heart is just racing like crazy. I get dizzy, lightheaded, I can barely breathe. Um, and in my chest, it feels full. It's not a good thing. High, high uh, risk of stroke, all these things. And I know it when I'm in it. I immediately came out of it. Amazing. I couldn't believe it. The next day, the same thing happened. I was at home. Seemingly without cause, I went into AFib again. Thankfully, I didn't have to drive to the cities. I walked out the front door, sat down on the grass, put my hand in the grass, and again, immediately came out of AFib. Since then, I ground every day. Uh, most mornings, if you come to my home, five, yeah, six, not five. Most mornings, not five. You'll see me walking around in the grass with bare feet. Now, this time of year, it's pretty cold, um, so I don't do it as long. But I feel amazing. I haven't gone into AFib ever since. I'm off my medication. It has been tremendous benefit for me. And I had no idea that this was even a thing. Now, why do I tell you these stories? I thought he was going to preach. What is he doing right now? Yes, this is, it is a sermon. But as dramatic as learning about grounding has been to my physical health, my theological understanding has taken even more of a turn. Not a U-turn but rather a turn down a road I did not even know existed. <clears throat> Just like I didn't know you should have sodium with water or that the earth is practically a battery, I didn't know what I'm about to explore with you was even a thing. It was that big of a game changer for me. Now, don't be afraid, please. While the passage we're going to look at, it is controversial. It's not that controversial. I'm not talking about heretical issues. And I'm not saying that I used to believe one thing and now I believe another. I never really thought about it at all. But now thinking about it and studying it, it has literally changed the framework by which I look at the Bible as a whole. The scripture we're going to look at is in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. And it just happens that I've delved deeply, as I've delved deeply into this what the writer of Genesis was saying, it's another one of those for me, I can't believe I didn't know that moment. So please, if you do have a Bible, please open it and let's read together Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Okay, so it says this. When men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive, and they took as, they, as their wives any that they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim, or many of your translations might say the giants, were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. When the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were, who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of his thoughts, of his heart, 
were only evil continually. And that's the end of the reading. So if I were to summarize this passage, it would be something like this. Sometime before Noah's flood, fallen angels copulated with human women and had babies. Then uh, their offspring were extraordinarily extraordinary in strength and evil, resulting in the worldwide flood. There are those who would disagree with my summary. They would have some objections and they would have some questions. And I would imagine that some of you have some questions. For one, how can angels be with women? That's a good question. Thankfully, whoa, was that too loud? Thankfully, we don't only have this passage of scripture that talks about angels and their physical characteristics. There are many, but I want to mention just a few. And you might be like me and say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. So think of Abraham and Sarah. You remember the story where Sarah laughed when the angel told her, you're going to have children? Well, what does it say that the angels did while they were there with Abraham and Sarah? The text specifically says that they ate a meal with them. They ate a meal, put food in their mouths, and went down their throats into their stomachs. How about this story? Jacob, when he gets his name changed to Israel, what happened? How did he get his name changed? The scripture says he wrestled with an angel. The angel could wrestle with him. And, and the, it was such a physical encounter that the angel dislocated Abraham's hip. Right? Physical. It wasn't a ghost. It was physical. Or how about the story of Lot in Sodom? He was visited by angels, it says. He brought them to his home. And the people tried to break into the house so that they could be with the angels. Now this, as Tim Hawkins, the comedian, would say, this is one of those stories that you're not going to see in your precious moments Bible. When we see angels in the Bible, they have bodies just like humans. Now we don't know if they just appear for a time, but it seems like they have physical characteristics just like us. Another Objection for those who do not see an element of fallen angels. Involvement in Genesis 6 is in the phrase, sons of God. There's an argument that that phrase refers just to men. For time, I'm not going to explain their position, but rather I will explain why it seems clear to me that the phrase sons of God is referring to fallen angels. The strongest argument I feel that makes the case that these sons of God were fallen angels, is in the text, meaning right from the other passages in the Bible. As a side note, one of the source material I've read a lot this year was from an author named Ryan Peterson in his books, Judgment of the Nephilim and Return of the Nephilim. I've also read and studied a book called The Unseen Realm by Dr. Michael Heiser, which has been a huge help. One of Peterson's stated goals was to just use the Bible to make his arguments. And I really appreciated that. The phrase sons of God in Hebrew is Benai Ha Elohim. It is used in the Old Testament a number of times, always referring to angelic beings. In Job, we see it used in chapters 1 and 2. The two chapters, which I'm sure you're probably familiar with, yes? Job, at the very beginning, it says that some, the sons of God came to serve God, and among them came the adversary. God's interaction with the adversary, who we call Satan, was in the midst of the sons of God. Twice it says that, chapter 1 chapter 2. Also in Job, chapter 38, this is one of... This is one of my favorite Bible passages, I would say. My, my daughter, Rachel, my 14-year-old my daughter, Rachel, and I, since she was seven, we were memorizing scripture together. And uh, to this day, 
If I say to her, if I say to her, Rachel, hey, are you ready? And she'll say, yeah. Or she'll do it. She'll say, Dad, you ready? I say, yeah. And we'll start quoting this. It goes, then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth of the where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you understand. And then God continues and says, Do you know on what the earth's base was placed? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and here it is, all the sons of God shouted for joy. The answer to God's rhetorical question to Job was. I don't know. I wasn't there. The only beings present when God created the earth were the Benai Ha'Elohim, the sons of God. There are also three New Testament passages that reference the Genesis 6 event. Peter mentions it in both of his letters, and Jude mentions it. 1 Peter 3, which is one of the verses that I was going to focus on, which I find to be a fascinating passage, says this. He was put to death. Jesus, he's talking about Jesus. This is 1 Peter 3, verses 18 through 20. He was put to death in the flesh, but brought to life by the Spirit. And in this form, he went and made a proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. To those who were disobedient long ago, in the days of Noah, when God waited patiently during the building of the ark. Seems pretty obvious what he's talking about, yes? Does that not floor you, what Jesus did there? This is somewhat of a parenthesis here, but what did Jesus went and proclaimed to them what he had just done? He died. His body stayed in the tomb, and it says his spirit went to say to the fallen angels, I beat you. Look what I did. He proclaimed to them. I love that. Peter was writing to the church to encourage them, trying to spur them on to be faithful in doing good, even to the point of physical persecution if need be. He mentions Jesus as an example said, Jesus, after all, suffered physically even to death. And then in the spirit, he went to proclaim to the fallen angels what he had done. Awesome. Also in Jude, another reference to the sons, to this Genesis 6 event. said, Jude, it's more of as a warning to the church to not be like the fallen angels who did not keep within their original authority, but abandoned their proper sphere He has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting change for the judgment of the great day. Listen to what R.A. Torrey, past president of of my alma mater, Moody Bible Institute, says in his book, Difficulties in the Bible, Alleged Errors and Contradictions. He wrote this in 1907. This is a long quote. Try to stay with me here. It says, if we so interpret it here, The preaching was not at all to men who had been wicked in the days of Noah, but to supernatural beings who had been disobedient in the days of Noah and who were now in prison in consequence of their disobedience. Are there any scripture passages that hint that there were supernatural beings who were disobedient in the days of Noah and who were consequently in prison? Are there? There are. In Genesis 6, verse 1, we are told that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. He continues, Many commentators understand the descendants of Seth, a godly man, to be the sons of God in this passage. But if we are to interpret scripture by scripture, which is always a great idea, they seem to rather have been angelic beings. There seems to be a clear reference to this passage in Jude 6, where we are told of angels which kept not their own principality, but left their proper habitation, and in consequence were kept in everlasting chains 
in darkness until the judgment of the great day. End of quote. Almost one year ago, I was, my wife was listening to a podcast where this Ryan Peterson, the author of one of the, the, the two of the books I, was, I mentioned earlier, he was, he was a guest. What caught my attention mostly was that he was saying things that were completely off my radar. I was so intrigued that I spent the day listening to a lecture of his, own, of his on, on YouTube. I then bought his first book and I studied it. And I bought the second book. I studied it. And really what ended up happening is I fell in love again with God and his word. To wrap things up, I have three, three things that I want to end with. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first is, is really a personal. Um, and the last two are from the text. I hope that all of them are an encouragement to you. My awakening... To this understanding of Genesis 6 has created a fascination in me with the pre-flood world. I just can't get enough of, leave, of learning about the ruins being discovered. They're so old and they existed before the flood. I just can't get enough of it. In a world that wants desperately to say that no God, that there is no God, more and more discoveries are proving the biblical record to be true. Do you know that around the world, ancient civilizations are being uncovered that talk about demigods, people who are offspring of gods and humans? Many of you probably are familiar with the Greek gods and maybe Maui of the islands. But how about the Mesopotamian Apkalus? or the Irish Ku Chulain, or the African Tiurak. Are these the men of renown that the Bible mentions? And in practically all of the world's cultures, there is a story of a great flood that destroyed the earth. And remember, all these cultures around the world they didn't have internet. They didn't talk to each other. Independently, around the world, discoveries are made. Sculptures of demigod men. Writings that talk about these men who have supernatural powers. It's a fascinating study, and I love it. From the text, there's a couple of things I want to leave with you. There's so many, but I just tried to narrow it down to just these two things. First off, God destroyed the entire earth, saved one man and his family, and imprisoned the per perpetrating fallen angels, and they are still there. They're still in prison. In all of the contexts when this story is mentioned in the New Testament, the nature of the transgression is the same. Inappropriate physical relations. That inappropriate physical relations, to keep it G, huh? Can we do that? Has been made so casual, so cheap, and it is a major element that the enemy attacks. It's not new, but in our culture, it's so easy, so flippant. I think we might need a reminder of how meaningful and important it is. Furthermore, do you see a connection? I know we haven't talked about Genesis chapter 1. But Genesis chapter 1 records the first thing that God said to Adam and Eve. Do you remember what he said? The first command that God gave to Adam and Eve. Be fruitful and multiply. And take control of the earth. The earth is yours. Take control of it. Be fruitful, multiply. And in the first verse of Genesis chapter 6, it says, Man began to multiply. 
the enemy saw what was happening, so he enticed the fallen angels, fallen angels to do what they did. My exhortation to you is this. Know the tactic of the enemy. Be aware and resist. I find it fascinating in studying this. God's interaction with Cain. You're familiar with the story, but remember this, okay? Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Call it what? The proto-evangelicum. Proto the first time that God even gave a hint to Satan of how he was going to beat him. Right? He gave him a hint. He said, you're going to crush a descendant. You're going you're gonna to strike his heel, but a descendant of the woman is going to strike your head. He's going to kill you. A descendant of the woman. So what does the enemy do right away? You got Cain and you got Abel. They both bring offerings to God. Whose was accepted? Abel's. The enemy is thinking to himself, now the text doesn't say this. God said to Cain, the text does say this. God said to Cain, Cain, sin is crouching at your door. But, what did he say to him? You can overcome it. Cain didn't have to kill Abel. Do you think God was lying to Cain? Or did he mean it? Like, you don't have to do this, Cain. I know what's in your heart, but you don't have to do it. He did. Satan enticed Cain to kill Abel. And that didn't work. That wasn't the seed. That wasn't the descendant that, that God was talking about. There were so many times in the scripture, you think that those genealogies were for accident? No. The genealogies that are listed are to show that this, the descendant is really, really important. Through the seed of the woman, he will cr I will crush your head. He tried it in Genesis chapter 6. Satan didn't succeed. Tried it all over in the, in the Old Testament. Satan didn't succeed. And finally then, Jesus comes on the scene. Now listen to this. Jesus comes on the scene and Satan kills him. And do you know, it was not, Satan did not know that by killing Jesus would mean his defeat. He did not know that. If he would have known that killing Jesus would result in Jesus' resurrection and Jesus then ascending to the Father and pouring out his Holy Spirit onto the church, Satan wouldn't have done it. Is that not amazing? You think of the proverb, 25 verse 2. Proverbs 25, 2. Does anybody know it? I know I quote it all the time. My wife tells me, I quote that all the time. I love it. It is the glory of God to what? Conceal a matter. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the honor of kings to search it out. Hallelujah. He likes to hide things. He does it on purpose. In fact, that was the title of my sermon. It was going to be. He loves to hide things. He hid it from the enemy. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, he says, we are communicating a secret wisdom from God, which has been hidden until now, but which before history began, God had decreed would bring us glory. Not one of this world's rulers has understood it, because if they had... They would, not have, they would not have executed the Lord from whom the glory flows. They didn't know. They didn't know. I love that. Love that. Worship team, do you guys want to come up? I asked the worship team to, to, to lead us in this song. It's called The Lord Most High. It's an old one. I love it. It's one of my favorite. It's an echoing song. I'm sure you'll, you'll figure it out. Men, women. It's a simple song. Lord Most High. Lord Most High. Listen, there, there, are, there are many gods. Small g. Many gods. There's one that's most high. There's only one. 
He is the most high. He is the most beautiful. He is the most powerful. He's the most wise. All the other ones, they're not insignificant. They want you to follow them. They want your devotion. They want to distract you. They want to discourage you. But there's only one that always wins. He always wins. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Let's sing together, huh?